All right, Sheriff, tell me a little bit about what you have you heard about this investigation when it comes to Doggett. Obviously, it just got re released just a minute, minute moments ago, so right. tell me what you know so far. So first, I do want to express our condolences to the Doggett family. Um, losing a loved one is hard, and I know uh, grief has got to be pretty much um, the place they're coming from right now. But we did, just with everybody else, watch the release um, from the prosecutor's office um, and release the fact that the officer would not be charged in this incident, but that the driver of the pursuit vehicle was going to be charged. Um, that That's certainly an outcome we somewhat anticipated knowing um, the case to the, to the extent that we did. But I think it's also important for people to just really understand the process. In this context, um, the case was investigated by Michigan State Police. So we, as the Sheriff's Department, have not even seen the results of this investigation for Michigan State Police because that goes directly to the prosecutor. The prosecutor, prosecutor uses that to make their decision which he's done, and I heard that decision the same time everybody else did. What the Sheriff's Office does is to do an internal investigation. Our job is to look at the protocols and whether um, the deputy followed the protocols, um, is the training consistent with what it needed to be, was the supervision what it should have been, and make evaluations based on those things. So that investigation hasn't quite concluded yet because we needed the results of this investigation to finalize it. That being said, um, the deputy involved is expected to return to full duty in the very near future as soon as that investigation concludes. So they're still on uh, paid men? They go paid administrative leave um, by contract over the course of this investigation, which is pretty consistent with law enforcement agencies throughout Michigan. How long has this investigation been going on now? Uh, I believe April. Sixth is the date, or eighth. Yeah, so I believe it's the eighth. She's confirming yes. That's right. So since initially it starts right then. You know, we um, we do have to wait for the criminal investigation to really kind of get on their way before we can do a lot. Like something as simple as the statement of the officer. We wait for the officer to make the criminal statement, um, criminal investigation statement first, and then um, use it then to do part of our internal investigations. And, and similar to the Michigan State Police investigation, we'll review cameras um, from the vehicle and we'll evaluate the compliance with policy with ours, where their compliancy with law in their investigation. So, although very similar in nature, they are inherently parallel in nature and often will come to um, results that are similar with each other but not not exactly because they're looking at different things. So you think the internal investigation would be what done today? Maybe? I'd, I would guess probably for sure by the end of this week that we would c conclude this investigation. Um, yeah, we haven't gotten the case yet so I'm given some time to have the case brought. Um, I literally moments before you came in saw the written copy of the prosecutor's statement um, for review. So there's just steps. And I guess that kind of does go to some of the things that we think are really important, and that's the due process part of this. Just like any other investigation, if we're investigating some event that happens in the community, we're very careful to, to go through due process, to develop probable cause, to keep evidence confidential until it's been evaluated so as not to um, make the investigation outcome partial to any perspectives that might be shared. And, and I'm grateful in this context we were able to allow the process to work out. Um, I do concur with the results and I, I appreciate the deliberate efforts made to make this investigation fair. So maybe, hopefully, this deputy could be back on the uh, out there again by late this week, if not early next week. Yeah, I honestly have to look at his schedule, <laughs> so I really don't know. But yes, yeah, soon, very soon. I would expect either of those possibilities would be possible. Uh, what is uh, the protocol for utilizing a cruiser when a suspect is fleeing on foot? One more time. What is the protocol for utilizing a cruiser when a suspect is fleeing on foot? I, I, 
I really can't answer that very succinctly because our policy is based on totality of circumstances, the initial reasons for the pursuit, the, um, the factors involved about whether or not reasonably you can bring your cruiser to a stop um, and exit the vehicle, what other jeopardies might be around in the neighborhood. And, and just to give a couple examples in this context, you know, the pursuit transitions from the roadway onto uh, a parking lot, which causes the deputy to have to maneuver through some obstacles. Um, about four seconds from the time the officer turns over the curb and this event comes to a stop, in four seconds, he's trying to track multiple suspects, multiple obstacles, um, trying to see what might be behind him, trying to assess dangers that might be there for the community. It's a very short period for that officer to assess, but yet that is what the policy is that they have to assess. It's not only our policy, it's, it's how it has to be done. Um, so the officer is assessing a lot in a very short period of time and he's trying to do whatever he can to bring that to a close as safely as possible, but still allowing an opportunity to bring the suspect into custody because obviously that's important also for the safety of the community at large. Uh, to clarify, were you just trying to give an overall example or were you trying to further explain what happened with the Doggett's case? And both of them. I can, you know, given the Doggett case as an example, uh, this cruiser has four seconds from the time it turns in off the roadway. Again, multiple suspects. This officer at the moment he's pulling in is alone. And in this context, he notices a neighborhood behind the parking lot where and it's the time of evening where people are out. He can see other people out in the community, out in, in harm's way potentially that again is part of what the policy requires that they assess what the surrounding circumstances what other jeopardies might be there um, he did that in the way that we would have expected him to is this a maneuver often used like how like help me with maneuver um like when you're talking about maneuver like because i obviously you remember you were talking about the parking lot maneuver like turning so in my viewpoint he's turning off the roadway into the parking lot and trying to position his car as closely as he can so that he can get out of his car and pursue. Uh, and yes, that would be very common to do because if somebody is out of your sight before, and I mean, you, so you're parking a vehicle, you have to unbuckle yourself, you have to take your key, you have to then be on foot, get around your door and then pursue. Um, it's not a one-second operation, not even a two-second operation. It takes a few seconds for an officer to get out of the vehicle and be in a position to pursue. So yes, we want our officers to be as close to that person as possible when they begin this process. Um, but you know, the exact actions, moments that, you know, they're fluid and they're not something I can prescribe in policy. Okay. Um, talk to me a little bit about um after seeing this video in more context, does this department still stand by its prior statement that this incident is a direct result of the inherent risk of accompanying the serious criminal activity that Riley was engaged in during the week and month um, um, cleaning up to the incident? So, um, yes. I think very clearly um, when you are jumping out of a vehicle that is still moving, and then running uh, in the close proximity of a police officer's cruiser, there is an inherent decision of risk there. Um, moreover, this wasn't the first event. This was one of two pursuits that night. It was one of six or seven pursuits over the course of several days prior to, um, several of which Mr. Doggett is in the vehicle while um, the pursuits are happening. So um, I think this is way different than one bad event for a young man. This is a series of decisions that caused an inherent risk um, and he ultimately was killed in, in the event. Um, certainly not an outcome we would have hoped for, certainly not an outcome that we planned for, but um, because of his proximity to the risk, the danger, uh, 
he ended up being involved in a fatal accident. What goes to your mind tonight? You know, I, you know, as a parent, certainly I have grief for this family, but I'll say as the sheriff, I think it's important for our entire community to understand a couple things. One, how dangerous this driving behavior, and not just the driving behavior, the other criminal activities associated with it. Um, there are a number of victims in Kent County that have been victimized by groups of kids, including this one, um, but some also not including this group. Uh, car thefts have increased by multiple percentage points over this last several years. These cars are being used for very dangerous behaviors. These kids are literally driving around in our community at high rates of speed very, very often. And beyond that, they're breaking into cars. We've had firearms stolen. We've had many credit cards stolen. Um, I think in the days prior to this event, just in Kent County, we had like 15 victims. We had um, $280,000 worth of property stolen and damaged just in the few days prior to this incident by this group of individuals. So it's important that the community frame it and understand what that officer is faced with. And then I ask that they consider what it must be like to be an officer who witnesses, you know, two uninvolved vehicles being rammed, a vehicle driving at a high rate of speed in a way that is absolutely dangerous to the community at large. And faced with that decision of what do I do now and how do I keep this from causing victims in our community? How do I get these individuals in custody and how do I do so as safely as possible? It's a torturous decision for a deputy. And um, you know, my heart also goes out to our officer who was faced with this and to the officer tonight and the one tomorrow night and the night after that who are also going to be faced with very dangerous decisions. And the fact that they're, they are um, due, due process and they get to have a real consideration of um, these events and not be called into question just sheer from the fact that they're a police officer, that they should have a review done and it needs to be fair and impartial and there needs to be appropriate time to do that review and, and very much evaluate the real facts, not what individuals are trying to cast the scene as. Um, take me back um, to back to the internal investigation when it comes to this. Uh, does this deputy get back on the road immediately or as in like once your internal investigation is over um, or is there kind of like a protocol like hey you do this first like do some paperwork what 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 would be the steps so I mean there is a, a constant contact with an officer who's on paid administrative leave during an investigation and some of it's to support their mental health while they're going through this process because I'm sure you could imagine it's overwhelming for an officer to, to be in this position. So there's a lot of contact between the sheriff's office and our staff member. Regardless of the outcome of the investigation, they are still somebody we need to emotionally support. So that has been ongoing. Um, in the event the internal investigation uh, finds that there's a training gap of some sort or a lapse in policy, then there's typically training or um, could be in some cases discipline related to it. We're not done with that part of the review yet, so I can't answer that specific question in this context, but there might be a retraining um, day or two that would be involved after some kind of fatal incident um, or serious injury incident. So we would evaluate if there's anything that needs to be done in that regard, and then we typically would pair them up with somebody just um, to make sure they're in a good stable place before they're on solo duty again. I know a big question, because obviously I covered quite a bit of uh, stories with the Doggy family. They were asking for the release of the uh, video. How come you never did that? Um, one, we didn't have the full investigation because that was um, transferred to the Michigan State Police, frankly, at our request. Um, we knew our officer had been involved in what at the time looked like it may be a fatal incident. Uh, so we thought it was really important for transparency and impartiality that that investigation be done by another agency. So we transferred over to Michigan State Police. 
Um, the only evidence I had was um, just the partial evidence. And partial evidence being? Being just the in-car video. Okay. That's all we had here. And I think it was really important that that be evaluated with the physical evidence, um, that that be in evaluated with any witness statements, uh, any other facts that might be on the scene. I mean, accident reconstruction is a very detailed process. Often will reveal something different than what it looks like to the naked eye. And um, due process is really important for that officer. And because the evidence in this case, such a huge component of it was this video, uh, we thought it was important to hold that until it could be completely reviewed by the prosecutor's office. Obviously, we've seen, I haven't per personally seen it, but I've, from one of my uh, coworkers, tell me they, they've seen the dash cam. Did he have a body cam? Sorry, did this deputy have a body cam? He did, um, but it's from the position of the vehicle that you're seeing it. So I think as the prosecutor showed it, it actually had both videos side by side because they're looking in the same direction. So one really captured the internal actions of the officer as he's steering to see if his hands were on the dash. Um, but yeah, our system automatically turns on both at the same time. I think I've had everything. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Into I, what am I missing? We pretty much covered everything unless you wanted to get to add the exact stats that you kind of did with the turn to the thousand. Yeah, so yeah, our case, $280,000 $350,000 if you count Ottawa and Kent cases for just this group of kids. When you say group of kids, so there was two kids, obviously. Dogging. These two, yeah, so they have... Is there more? Is there more there are two? two more kids associated with this group, and different pairs of them are involved in different. So they interchange who's in the vehicle, who's driving, who's doing different acts over the course of these 10 days. And the officer involved was very aware of all the circumstances leading to it because it was an active investigation that our detectives were sharing with law enforcement um, that were on patrol so that we had an opportunity to get them in custody because again, the most significant thing was the series of very, very dangerous driving. And you can see part of that on the video if you were to watch it. Um, you know, at some point they're going against traffic on you know a divided roadway and it was incredible, and this was very, it was very uh, similar driving in many of the circumstances. Uh, eight different pursuits involving many different departments over the course of the two and a half weeks leading up to this. So, and five of those were within just several days prior to this incident. The second was of that evening, and that's partially referred to from the prosecutor's office. So. Um, you know, all of these things have to be taken in its totality as this officer is making these decisions in this moment and trying to balance the risk to the community and uh, the likelihood that he's able to get somebody in custody. So four totally were kind of observing over that two week span. Yes. Two being Doggett and the driver. The driver. Yeah. So there's two, still two. Right. Okay. And we are pursuing charges for that as well. Um, uh, so, like I said, I started at 2.30, but I saw the MSP release today uh, on Twitter where they were explaining that there was a chase from Ottawa to Kent County today. Mm -hmm. um, is that any correlation between what happened? Uh, similar behavior in on a broader scale related groups, but none of the four that uh, were directly involved in this crime spree. Um, were included in the four that were in custody today. But yes, definitely it's the same pattern of behavior that we're so nervous about, that I think the community needs to understand this isn't, you know, a, a bad decision on a night. This is a series of decisions um, that are happening over and over again. And frankly, even after they've been caught, they go back out and do it again. So it's not just a casual, youthful mistake. I know uh, MSP, it was a while back, came out with the discussion of like not pursuing after X amount of either. So is it, what, I know we had talked briefly just about policy when it comes to pursuits. Um, are you internally talking about this kind of stuff or? You know, we always do. Every case, you know, pursuits is one of um, the topics we talk about very often in law enforcement in general. Um, but I would say the danger to the community in some cases of not pursuing is greater than the danger of pursuing. 
and I think that's the balance test that law enforcement officers are faced with making on the, you know, in the spur of the moment. They, they have to evaluate all circumstances. And in this context, and according to Deputy McMain's own statement, uh, he was fearful of the next act if he didn't, right? Um, they would take another car. They would put other people at jeopardy with going through more cars and stealing more items. And um, then they would continue on to the next. And he had just witnessed them ramming to uninvolved vehicles right in front of the officer. So, you know, I think in most law enforcement's policy, there are weighing circumstances that that officer is made, whether, you know, the words might differ, but the evaluation that's expected in terms of weighing the risk of not doing anything with the risk of doing something in the context is generally part of the policy, and it is in ours.